I am James Watt, uh, the chairman of the Department of Asian Art in this museum. And um, this evening, uh, we are going to talk about our uh, current exhibition uh, in the Tisch Galleries. Um, it is a big and complex exhibition, and I didn't quite know how to approach it, so I prepared two versions. Uh, but I should give them both. But don't worry, I'm not going to be long. Uh, so we begin uh, with this. Uh, now, uh, just to give the historical context, um, this is the map of China, um, just before the Mongol conquest. Now, what you, can, what you notice, now this, the, the lighter area is the present map of China. And you notice that China proper was divided into at least three states, or four, one, two, three, four, and, the, and these are sort of extra. Um, uh, um, but what is important to note is that after the conquest and after the unification, unification of all of China under Kublai, China under the Yuan Dynasty covered all this vast area but it was only one part of the greater Mongol Empire which extended to Central Asia, the Jakartai, and in Russia, the Golden Horde, and in Iran, the Ilkhanid. So, I mean, it was a vast empire of which the Yuan was only one part, but it was a very important part because Kublai, at least uh, in principle, was the, the great Khan of the entire empire, although nobody else took his orders. Uh, in, in all the other areas except the Ilkhanid. Now, uh, there are only two slides for my first version. Uh, the, this is a gold cup of the early 13th century um, from North China. Now, the form is as old as pastoral nomadism. And uh, the form itself is um, simple, robust, and made of natural material. Uh, but um, in addition to its nomadic origins, you see a touch of decadence uh, because it's been decorated by incise, by incision, uh, with some floral decoration. And then a century and a half later in South China, you see this piece. Uh, which has the same basic form, but it is soft, it is um, uh, sophisticated, uh, and it's made of an artificial material, it's porcelain. Uh, so and that, that is the end of my first version. Uh, <laughs> that is to say, um, you transform from this into that. Uh, I just learned from sociologists is a phenomenon known as cultural mediation, I think. I think that is the term. But uh, that's it. Now, but, um, but to be more uh, serious, actually the first version is just as serious. Uh, you have, in addition to these stem cups, you have a kind of jewelry uh, worked in granulation and filigree which is a work, gold working technique, which was prevalent on the steppes of Northern and Central Asia since the time of Alexander. Uh, but it would come into China from time to time. Um, for example, in the Han period, uh, coeval with the Roman Empire, you have this kind of work, which is the same kind of thing, but it disappeared from China after uh, the ninth century and re-enter um, uh, with the Mongols into North China. But together, uh, archaeologically found together with the northern style jewelry, you have um, some Chinese work. And you don't need to know about gold working to know this is Chinese because the fruits look like lychees and they don't grow on deserts, uh, in deserts or 
uh, on the prairie. Uh, but uh, the whole thing is done in Ripuse, and that is the, the native Chinese go working technique. Now, um, during the time when the Mongols uh, marched west in the early uh, 13th century, they went through, I don't know what I can point uh, correctly, through um, Central Asia into Eastern Iran and came back through the Caucasus. And, and in the mean, in the en route, they destroy all the great rich cities of Central Asia. Uh, cities like Samarkand, uh, Bukhara, Herat, and as far as Eastern uh, Iran, uh, Isfahan and all that. And they brought back with them uh, the finest craftsmen uh, the world has ever known. Um, and they put them in uh, centers of reduction, either in Karakoram, uh, the capital of the Mongol uh, uh, Empire, and also in somewhere here, uh, Beshbalik, I think is there, uh, in Eastern Central Asia, where Chinese and Central Asian craftsmen work together to produce something known as the cloth of gold. Now, this is um, something that all Western visitors to the Mongol Empire would <laughs> remark upon. And you read any of the missionaries, and Marco Polo, of course, they all remarked upon this uh, cloth of gold, which is absolutely dazzling. Uh, this is a fine example of it in the Cleveland Museum. And you can see and you cannot see some, some aspects of the mixing of uh, Iranian and Chinese motifs. Um, the, um, the roundel with the adors, uh, winged lines, of course, is basically Iranian. Uh, now, I have to explain that Central Asians, doesn't matter what their ethnicity is. Uh, at that time, in these very rich trading cities, they were whether they were in religion Muslim, or whether they were ethnically Turks, or uh, they were culturally Iranianized. Um, so th this is what the patterns they would produce, but on the background of Chinese clouds. And the weave of this um, cloth of gold uh, was new to China. Um, it's known as the lampas, uh, in which there's a ground weave which its own set of um, with its own set of uh, web and warps uh, which you can see here and then there's a supplementary set of um, pattern webs bound by supplementary warps and these are the gold threads which cover the most part of the cloth and and they give this absolute dazzling uh, effect um, now uh, when Kublai declared himself in, in 1260, the great Khan of, uh, uh, of the Mongol Empire, the, his cousins in other parts of the Mongol Empire did not agree, and, and especially in this area, which became the Jakartai King uh, Khanate, um, uh, the descendants of other um, descendants of Kublai's uncles uh, would be stirring a lot of trouble and there would be a lot of fighting, a lot of civil war which raised along this area the border between Yuan and the Chakotai. And Beshbalik, the Greek center of weaving, uh, was always being attacked. So in um, 1275, Kublai decided to move the Beshbalik workshop to Dadu. To, to Beijing. And, and there, uh, they would weave cloth of gold. Uh, according to the records, um, Kublai ordered that they would weave cloth of gold for use, for imperial use, for collars and cuffs. And there you are, you see uh, Chai Bi, Kublai's wife, wearing a robe with borders uh, of cloth of gold with this pattern. I'll show you a detail. Now, the interesting thing about the pattern 
is that you see here a sort of grip in head, and you can see the same here. Now this is, uh, of course, not a Chinese pattern at all. Uh, this is a Western pattern, which brought in by the Central Asian weavers to Beijing at the beginning of the Besh Balik workshop in Beijing, in Dadu. Uh, and, but later on, uh, the Chinese cloth would go would then have purely Chinese patterns. But in the beginning, you can see the transition from a Central Asian style to a Chinese style over the 100 years or so of the Yuan. Uh, now, these are the more obvious uh, connections between China and Central Asia that we have just seen. But there are um, um, connections with Central Asia which are not obvious. If you uh, look at uh, this column, which is actually is the corner uh, stone of a great hall in Xanadu, in uh, Kublai's first capital, uh, you will see a dragon on floral ground, and you think, well, dragon is Chinese. But if you look at carefully at the characteristics of this particular dragon, you will see the, the head has a long elephantine snout, and then you can see also the tail is sort of entangled with the, with the hind leg. And now in the last room of the exhibition, you will see a Central Asian textile, a Central Asian tapestry, which has exactly the same dragon, uh, with this long snout, which comes from actually India, um, um, from the Makara, and then also the same uh, way the, the tail is treated, and also on the floral ground. Now, dragons on floral ground is not a Chinese tradition. Uh, this is, may not be obvious if you just look at a dragon, but that is the, that is the case. Um, so this is a, um, a less obvious influence of Central Asia in China. Now, uh, many people like this dog. Uh, um, we, that's why we see it. And, but now this dog, um, has taken a long time in China to evolve into this style. Um, now, you see, this is a 13th century dog, and this is a 1st century dog. You can see this is native Chinese style. This is what you can get in the 13th and 14th centuries. Now, how did it get from here to there? Uh, now, we have to go back to our earlier ex exhibition in 2004, uh, where we traced the, the origins of the art of the Tang Dynasty. Um, and um, in the 6th century, we had two uh, stone slabs of exactly the same subject. Um, here you have a stone slab from the Zogdian tomb uh, uh, with a princely or royal figure sitting on the stool, uh, an hourglass stool, uh, receiving some tribute from a leading person. And on another in a, um, a slab from a Chinese tomb, you have exactly the same subject matter, but here we have a Chinese gentleman receiving tribute from the barbarian. So, but the difference is, of course, one is carved in relief, um, uh, introduced by the Sogdians who were highly Iranianized at that time. And so these uh, reliefs are somewhat like the Achaemenid uh, uh, stone reliefs, but in China, uh, the emphasis always on the line. And, and so the, this version, in this picture transmitted from Central Asia uh, then becomes transformed into a Chinese picture with very, very fine, uh, elegant incised lines. And then after that, uh, Hellenistic influence came in, also in the 6th and 7th centuries. So now, again, again you can contrast this figure, uh, which is 
7th century or late 6th or early 7th century to a Han figure. The same uh, kind of comparison we made with the dog. Um, and, but this kind of sculptural style remained but only in North China and especially in the Northwest China in the provinces of Shanxi uh, uh, which, uh, and Gansu the two provinces, um, what? Um, which are provinces uh, nearest to Central Asia, of course. So they remain there until you get, in the 13th century, this kind of um, um, figural style, which uh, happened only in North China. Um, but, um, now, this, we sidetrack a bit because th that was a, uh, an entertainer and uh, in the exhibition, oh, sorry. In the exhibition, we have a special area for theater. Now, I wouldn't go into theater because theater would be a big topic. Uh, and we're going to have a public lecture on Chinese theater in the Yuan period later on, I think in December. Um, but I'll just briefly mention that uh, drama was, uh, or rather the Yuan period, was the golden age of Chinese drama. 80% um, of what you see in Peking Opera and all the other regional operas, um, this, the stories would be derived one way or another from one of the Yuan dramas. Um, and of course in Europe, since the um, Jesuits uh, reported back to Europe of what they see in China, what they saw in China, uh, people began also to be interested in Chinese, uh, in Yuan drama, and people like Voltaire in the 18th century, and in the 20th century, uh, Brecht would be writing plays uh, based on Chinese uh, drama. Now go back to the uh, question of relief versus incised. Um, now, after the unification of China, um, in the south, they began also to do uh, relief work, as you can see uh, on this uh, Longchuan uh, bottle uh, or vase. Um, uh, traditionally, in South China, they would only uh, have decoration by incising on the clay body before glazing, so that the decoration never interferes with the form. Whereas in the Yuan period, once the once North and South China were integrated, uh, then there was a radical change in potting style, uh, as you can see here. Um, the, the, the eight immortals, Taoist immortals, are left unglazed, but they are done in uh, relief. Um, this is a, a new um, a direction for uh, pottery art in uh, South China. And another thing is the very form of this piece, the octagonal shape. Of course, it's not a potter's shape. This is a potter's shape where you can imagine it being thrown on the wheel and grows on the wheel to its present form. But this one, you need to use the plastic quality of clay, the modeling quality, to make any shape you want. Now, so these are, and, and so you can imitate a metal shape. Uh, so there are two influences from the north. One is gold and silver uh, forms, and also the relief uh, decoration. Um, and then, of course, uh, also for the first time in South China, you also have sculpture in the round. Uh, this is a, a, another Taoist figure. Now, um, I have, I'm not going to deal with uh, religion, although there's a big section on religions uh, in the exhibition. Uh, suffice to say that Taoism, a native Chinese religion, was at its greatest ascendancy uh, during the Yuan period for various uh, reasons, and, and you have uh, little sculptures of Taoist figures, the Yuan plays are completely 
uh, uh, filled with characters uh, who are either Taoist, Taoist immortals or they are Taoist of one stripe or another. Um, so it was the most prevalent uh, religion and this is a dance uh, figure sculpted in the round and there's also paintings of Taoist subjects. Uh, nobody knows who this person is, he's probably one of the Taoist immortals. Uh, it comes from Cologne, the Museum of Eastern Art. Uh, the file on this painting is about two inches thick because nobody can decide on what, who this person is. So there, there are so many opinions. Uh, but you, can, you notice that this dog is the same dog as in the one in stone that we saw earlier. Uh, this particular dog, I don't know what kind of dog it is, but he appears in all the Yuan paintings, all the Yuan prints and, and sculptures. Uh, the same kind of transformation from plain to three-dimensional art uh, also uh, happened in all the other um, media, uh, as in lacquer. Uh, this is a 13th century piece, uh, which uh, uh, is in relief, but is flat relief. The surface is ac actually not modeled. But in the 14th century, you can see a transformation from a flat relief to a high degree of modeling uh, and overlapping. So there's a much greater three-dimensional effect uh, in the 14th century. Um, another effect of north-south integration is the, um, we see first, um, in North China, from about the 11th to the 13th century, you have this kind of uh, pottery, uh, which is decorated with painted uh, decoration. Whereas in the south, you have this very different style. Well, in the south, you have, I hope, you, I hope people in the back can hear me. No? Yeah, oh, good, thank you. Uh, um, whereas in the south, you have this um, very different style where the form is much more sort of uh, elegant, uh, but the aesthetic appeal depends more on the quality of the the the, um, the tactile and the textural quality of the of the glaze. When the northerners comes came south, the southern potters began to experiment with painted decoration. And this is uh, an early effort um, uh, using the same pigment iron uh, so the color comes out brown. But sometime in the middle of the 14th century, some Persian trader brought in cobalt. And overnight, blue and white is born. Uh, and it never left us. It's, uh, we are still uh, seeing blue and white. Um, now, this is uh, interesting. This is a kind, a kind of double absorption. First of all, you remember the stem cup, uh, and then um, the painting. Now, this is all, the stem cup is all the way from the far, far north, but from North China, you have painted dragon on the, uh, on the piece. Um, now, I'm going to just touch on a couple of... Uh, uh, points about the decorating of uh, blue and white porcelain. Um, you can see most on most blue and white porcelain of the uh, 14th century, uh, the decoration is done in registers, uh, starting usually at the bottom with um, lotus petals, which is which is derived from the 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 pedestal of a Sino-Tibetan Buddhist. Uh, uh, statues. And um, then th you have uh, some sort of border decoration. We'll talk about that in a minute. And also a floral scroll, which are also s standard decorative motifs. But the main field of the decoration uh, very often is a scene from a play or a popular story. And they are copied from the printed books of popular stories, as in this one, you can see 
This is the story of a 4th century BC uh, wizard. Um, and you can see the blue and white decorator copied more or less straight. But uh, instead of him riding on a chariot drawn by two tigers, I think here one of them, one of the, the animals is the leopard. I mean, so it was not always uh, straightforward copying, they also adopted to their own liking. Um, now, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the wave pattern, uh, which is very often on the border of dishes and also on the lip of, uh, of uh, vases and jars. Now, this pattern actually comes from a very popular type of painting in the Song period, in the preceding uh, dynasty of Song, from the 11th to 12th, 13th centuries. Um, the, um, um, one of the um, great types of uh, Chinese painting has more or less disappeared, but during the Song period, from the 11th to 12th centuries, water painting was a major genre in Chinese painting. And not only would you find paintings uh, of water in its various uh, states, from more or less calm, uh, gentle ripples to this big uh, breakers uh, in, every, in this every mood uh, you have uh, paintings of. And they would, you would find it not only paintings on paper and silk, but you also find it painted on uh, the same pattern on screens and on the walls of, of paintings, of, of buildings. Um, at the entrance to the Imperial Academy in, in the Kaifeng, the capital of the Northern Song, when you enter the front door, you're faced with a big screening wall uh, of wave painting. And, and this is one of the few surviving uh, examples of Song wave painting and is copy on uh, blue and white as a border decoration. But I want to sidetrack a bit and trace the, the fate of this uh, motif because it survived into the next century, into the early 15th century, where, the, where you no longer have this very, very lively pattern and became a bit stiff and, and formulaic. Uh, you can hardly recognize it as uh, wave patterns. And then another century later, in Turkey, when somehow, when early 15th century Chinese porcelain found its way to the Ottoman Empire, you have this kind of Isnik pottery, where, which is supposed to be a copy of early 15th century Chinese porcelain, but the wave pattern now becomes not recognizable. So I, this is totally beside the, the our point. Oh, sorry. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but let's uh, go back to Kublai. Uh, um, now you see him at the entrance to the exhibition. Uh, and this is his portrait, this is his likeness. But this is not the finished product because the imperial portraits of the Yuan were all done in textile. Um, in the palace records, composed in, uh, uh, in the time of his great-great-grandson, um, Tuk Timur, it is recorded that, uh, well, there's a chapter on imperial portraits, and there's a preface to this chapter which says, in the beginning, there was painting, and then there was sculpture, which was better, and now we have textile, which is the su supreme form of art. Uh, and so the, this chapter contained uh, a lot of instructions of uh, who uh, to ask to actually paint the likeness, and then who was instructed to supervise the weaving of the portrait and the dimensions. Um, and 
one, one, of the, one of the dimensions actually is exactly the same as this big uh, tapestry in our collection. Uh, because there are two types. One uh, is the imperial portrait, and another is the mandala, uh, which was woven for the initiation of uh, Mon Mongol emperors, because they all had to go through uh, initiation into Tibetan Buddhism. And that goes back to Kublai, or rather to Chaibi, his wife, who became converted to Tibetan Buddhism, and then he, he uh, she, persuaded Kublai himself to convert, and therefore, from that point on, every Mongol emperor had to be initiated into Tibetan Buddhism before they could uh, um, be enthroned. Uh, and, and this probably was made for one of those occasions, and you have the two emperors, uh, Tuk Timur and his, uh, and his brother, elder brother Kokshila, and the two wives. Um, and you can see that this is the painted portrait of Tuk Timur, and this is his woven portrait, although a tiny one. But you can see uh, what it is like to uh, have a woven portrait, because the, the um, tapestry gives it much greater uh, texture and also it gives it an added dimension because the gold threads uh, are not only thick, but they some to increase the to give the um, impression of a, a raised uh, area. There are sometimes the the warps, the I mean uh, the webs are sometimes wound around the warps several times uh, before you uh, go on. Take, taking it to the other um, um, end. So, so you have um, the gold dragons uh, coming up quite clearly. And the same actually happened also on the face, but it's too worn for that effect to, to, to be seen. But anyway, you can see exactly the same. Uh, uh, it is his likeness, uh, this one, which provided, which is the cartoon for the tapestry, although this one is only in miniature. Um, incidentally, in the exhibition, you will see a hat exactly like this. Um, now, when the hat came in, it looked more like a pancake. Uh, and the, and the, the, ch the um, chin strap was uh, separated. Uh, uh, in fact, when uh, my colleague and I went to the Gansu Museum to see the hat for the first time. The, this chain was attached to the, t to the top knot. Uh, and I asked the archaeologist, I said, uh, did it come out like that? He said, yes. Uh, so we took it. I thought, well, this is rather peculiar. But when it came, when he arrived in the museum, they took the, the, the chain was taken off, and I saw the string was new. So I thought it could not have been a... 14th century piece of string. So, uh, so we reconstructed it according to this painting, and now that's the way you see it in the exhibition. Um, and now there are many examples of what our conservators uh, did to make the exhibition or make the exhibits look the way they do now. I mean, um, and, and this is something that I think can only happen in the uh, in the Metropolitan Museum, where we have, where we have um, uh, expertise in practically every area. Uh, now, finally, I want to uh, um, say a, a few words about the acculturation of the Mongols uh, into Chinese culture. We have read, we have made the connection between Central Asia. In China, we have made the connection between North and South China, the integration of North and South uh, and, the, and the results. And now, what about the Mongols in China? Um, he, what you see here is a, uh, another tapestry, a 
extremely fine work, looks like a painting, uh, but it is a um, cosmological diagram, uh, according to the Tibetans. Uh, you have in the center, uh, Mount Meru, the axis of the universe or the cosmos, uh, uh, with um, surrounded by by um, layers of uh, ocean and and land, and then the the four big oceans in the four directions, uh, with the continents. Uh, each with three continents, and I think we live in actually one of these continents. I've forgotten which one, but uh, but all the all the three all the four continents have their color associations. The east uh, is silver, and there's white. The west is um, ruby, which is red. The south is lapis, uh, blue, and the north is gold. Um, and the, the yellow color has faded on this piece, so it looks like the, the, the white one. But the uh, reason why I'm showing this is this is the typical uh, Tibetan cosmological diagram. Uh, and in the early days of the Mongol Empire, the great halls in the palace were painted exactly according to this scheme. That is to say, on the east wall you have white, on the west wall you have red, and blue and gold, and so on. Um, and it wasn't until the last emperor of the Yuan that it was changed to, the decoration was changed to Chinese landscapes. And it happened uh, on one occasion when the emperor was about to go to the to the northern capital or the upper capital, uh, Shangdu or Zhenandu, uh, for the summer as all emperors did. Uh, they spent all the summer months uh, further north and he ch uh, charged the resident, that is to say the man who was left in charge of the capital when the emperor is away, to say, please have the palaces redecorated. And this man whose name is Dharma, uh, uh, we don't know what nationality or what ethnicity he was, but what he did was instead of painting the same colors again, he hired uh, painters to paint uh, landscapes uh, on the walls of the palace. And when the emperor returned, he said, oh, well done, this is wonderful. Uh, um, and he actually was very pleased, uh, instead of the same boring colors, uh, to have actual landscapes. Now, uh, this also illustrates something else. That is to say, it, the, the later emperors, the, actually the later members of the imperial family, were by that time, by the second quarter of the 14th century, 50 years, the last 50 years of the Mongol, Mongol period. They were so highly uh, synthesized that um, many of them were collectors, especially uh, the Grand Princess Senge, who uh, was probably one of the greatest collectors of Chinese art in Chinese history. Uh, we have two vessels actually in the exhibition uh, which are, uh, bear her, her name or her title anyway uh, at the beginning uh, in the section of ritual, uh, uh, ritual vessels or, um, because she donated two bronze vessels, ritual uh, vessels, to two temples, and is described as donations from her. But um, but anyway, they, they they were not only collectors; they appreciated uh, Chinese painting. They actually practiced. Uh, oh, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, um, they actually painted. Uh, uh, in Chinese style. And this is a painting by a Mongol uh, who was the Taoist who um, painted this uh, picture for a fellow Taoist and his friends, or his literary friends, uh, all inscribed poems in praise of the painting uh, above. 
and then uh, and one of them this person there um, signs himself as Jacob now this is was a Christian or Nestorian Christian uh, who um, they all retain their Christian names uh, throughout the Mongol uh, period although they came from uh, the north they they most of them, the Onguts, most of them retained, uh, resided in Inner Mongolia, just north of the present city of Hohort, uh, in the in the in the um, uh, Green Mountains, just north of Hohort. And so, here we have an example of um, the acculturation of uh, the Mongols themselves into Chinese culture. Well, Chinese, well, I mean, done by a brush? Yes, that's all. I mean, the, um, anything done with brush and ink, um, um, bamboo, I don't think anybody else does this. I mean, I can't describe it. Uh, not any more than I can describe what is uh, European Renaissance uh, style. Right? Um, and now, but in the meantime, uh, Chinese painting as an art form has gone through a, ma a, a major change, um, which is exemplified by uh, this painting by Zhang Wenfu, by far the most influential painter and uh, artist in the Yuan period. And now this is the kind of painting which would be would set the the model or the standard for subsequent uh, ages, and the emphasis here is not on any kind of realistic um, um, representation of a real landscape or the actual landscape, but the emphasis is more on the elegant brush work. Um, and this is how paintings, Chinese paintings, have been looked at ever since. Um, and this uh, then led to his nephew's painting, uh, which doesn't make sense in uh, as a representation of a real landscape, but he's greatly admired because of the brushwork. And the last piece I want to talk about is this. Uh, this is the the final exhibit in the in in the exhibition. Uh, it is a carpet from Kyoto. Uh, used to be paraded around Kyoto every year um, at the annual festival, at the Gion annual festival. Um, but uh, after it's been dated to 14th century, they don't, they don't do it anymore. Uh, but uh, you see what happens is here in the center you have the most typical Chinese painting, uh, one of the most uh, common Chinese uh, subjects in some of the most common subjects in Chinese painting, uh, which is plum blossoms. They are actually blossoms originally, but they've fallen out. Uh, if you look at the back of the carpet, you can see quite clearly beautiful blossoms on these branches. Uh, but the the interesting thing is, it is surrounded by a pseudo Kufic border, uh, which is from uh, Islamic art. So you have uh, something which is so typically Southern Chinese, particularly associated with the, with the literati. Um, and then you have something which is clearly Islamic. But even more interesting is this. If you look at, on that carpet from the side, you will see that the border pattern and the, and the plum tree uh, is now raised half an inch above the ground of the carpet. And the reason is this, that the brown parts which uh, delineate the, the main decoration uh, was woven in animal hair. Um, um, it is actual animal fur which do not uh, uh, decay. Uh, in the same way as wool. Uh, 
you can see that it's really down to the to the ground. All the all the wooden parts have sort of disappeared, leaving the part which is woven by uh, with animal hair standing up. Uh, now this is uh, now what does what does this mean? This means this gives us another connection. Um, there is in Chinese records, uh, which I read some time ago, um, that people of the on the steppe of northern and central Asia would would weave carpets with animal hair, uh, and uh, no one has ever seen such a thing until this piece turned up. Uh, so, um, so it is actually true uh, that. Sometimes uh, uh, carpets were woven in certain parts of the nomadic world uh, uh, with uh, animal fur. Um, and um, so in this carpet, you have then the whole of the Mongol Empire. You have the Islamic world in the west of the empire. You have southern China, the last bit to be conquered by the Mongols, and you have, as part of the construction, uh, uh, following the tradition of weavers on the steppe of Central and Western Asia. And that really sums up even better than the two examples I show at the very beginning. Um, the um, the material culture of the Mongol world um, as display in, the, in objects, in the work, works of art. Thank you very much. Thank you.